1995 King of the Ring fits neatly onto a very narrow plane of infamy. To some, it's the absolute dirt worst production ever spit out by the WWF amid its clueless new generation doldrums. To others, it's the worst Big Five pay-per-view of all time. Notable for the very idea that somebody in power approved a lineup so tepid on paper and far more putrid in actual execution. And some would even go as far as to call it the worst WWE pay-per-view ever, regardless of era or designation. You may have only heard about the 1995 King of the Ring, while others are at least familiar with its less than sterling reputation. This video will seek to adequately explain all of the historical badness so that you don't have to waste three hours of your life having your soul sucked out. And those who have seen it, well, pull up a chair. You've already suffered enough watching it through once, so you may as well enjoy the autopsy. King of the Ring 1995 is one of the worst shows ever. In 1993, the World Wrestling Federation cemented its Big Five by installing the King of the Ring in June. This placed an attraction in between the late March and early April's WrestleMania and the end of August SummerSlam, and it was equipped with a purpose. The winner of a single elimination tournament would be crowned King. Quite literally. Bret Hart donned the royal splendour after a tremendous 1993 card, mostly thanks to his efforts, while his little brother Owen took home the 1994 honours. The 1994 show was noteworthy for the guest commentary of local football legend Art Donovan, who had literally zero product knowledge and just seemed all round clueless when it came to wrestling. And with attributes like that, it's astonishing Art wasn't hired for the creative team years later. Actually, come to think of it, he may have booked this very show. If you'd have been watching WWF long enough before 1995, you could see how bad things had deteriorated. That year's 30-man Royal Rumble was equipped with mere one-minute intervals due to a less than impressive star power at hand. 11 wrestlers lasted three minutes or less in the match, while seven of those individuals, including Owen Hart, were gone in under 30 seconds. They probably should have thrown in some modern chaotic camera cuts to sort of hide the ugliness of that one. WrestleMania 11 further underlined company woes. The WWF title match between the towering chosen one Diesel and the uber-talented Shawn Michaels had to play second fiddle to a celebrity encounter involving another football hall of famer, Lawrence Taylor. LT was famous, but not life-altering crossover famous, and his, his match with Bam Bam Bigelow headlined the least bought WrestleMania to date. Additionally, WrestleMania 11 featured only seven matches, down from the usual 10 or so, a clear sign that WWF brass felt the roster was a little bit lighter on prestige. Money was another issue. The WWF had lost $4.4 million in the last fiscal year that ended on April 30th, which would bring about heavy downsizing through summer months. Before summer was out, the active roster barely had 40 wrestlers on it. Some of those who'd feel the cut of the axe will play at least a small part in this story. After all, 16 individuals would have to compete in qualifying matches for the King of the Ring tournament. A field of that size will reveal the roster's present depth or lack thereof. And these were somewhat tense times. Ted Turner had authorized a one hour Monday night time slot for WCW to go head to head with Raw beginning in September. The smaller ECW was growing a cult following on the expanding fringes of lapsed Federation fandom. With these details in mind, it'd be rather timely for the WWF if something like King of the Ring could restore some of that fading mojo. Spoilers, it didn't. The 1995 King of the Ring was booked for the Spectrum in Philadelphia, a long-time Federation stronghold. Major monthly cards were once held in the 19,000-seat venue and broadcast on regional pay-per-view, but those were from a bygone time. After all, this was the new generation, the generation where Bob Buckland and Captain Lou and Nikolai Volkov and King Kong Bundy had each taken part in notable angles over the preceding year or so. Joking aside, the incumbent leader of the new generation, Big Daddy Cool Diesel, reigning WWF champion since November, would main event this King of the Ring. While McMahon was hoping to mould Kevin Nash into his new age Hulk Hogan, it's fair to say that Diesel Mania wasn't exactly running wild by the summer of 1995, as evidenced by the low attendance and other paltry metrics. 
Now, Nash sometimes gets blamed for WWF's woes, but it really wasn't his fault. For one thing, it's not like the heel side of the WWF roster was particularly strong, so there weren't many looming threats to Diesel's title that would make for compelling programming. Case in point, the main event of King of the Ring would pit Diesel and Bam Bam Bigelow in tag team action against the million dollar corporation members Psycho Sid and Tatanka. Yeah, it's not exactly the Mega Powers versus the Mega Bucks, is it? Now, rather than put the WWF title at stake, the company opted to have this tag team match serve as a bridge between two diesel defenses against Sid at the May and July In Your House events. Add Tatanka into the main event mix, and damn, you've got me sold already. But fear not, because Vince was going to assemble a new challenger to Diesel by night's end. The only other non-tournament bout pitted Bret Hart against Jerry the King Lawler in a continuation of their 1993 feud that ended well, rather abruptly. Hart endured a tainted loss to Lawler at the prior months in your house, a defeat made more agonising by the fact that Hart had dedicated his performances that night to his mum, as it was Mother's Day. So of course, Brett sought revenge, and revenge would come in the form of a kiss my foot match, where the loser would have to smooch the piggies of their mortal nemesis. And as childish as it may sound, even by the self-imposed standards of creative back then, seeing the hitman finally humiliate that pesky king once and for all would be fairly rewarding. And it would finally pay off an angle that began with Hart winning the 1993 King of the Ring tournament a couple years ago. Speaking of tournaments, let's take a look at what got cobbled together on the 1995 bracket, shall we? Now, the qualifying process began at the inaugural In Your House in May, when a recently healed turned Mabel pinned Adam Baum in just a couple of minutes. On Raw the next night, Bob Sparkplug Holly pinned Cultaholic's patron saint, Mantor. So far, four wrestlers, four individuals inducted into the halls of WrestleCrap for the characters that they were playing here. The next qualifier was only half crappy as beloved star Razor Ramon defeated long forgotten Jacob Blue, aka one of the Harris twins under one of the 60 different names he used in his career. Then it was a battle of WrestleMania world title challengers of different eras as a now babyface and wildly popular Shawn Michaels pinned an aging King Kong Bundy. Now, you're probably thinking, so far, not bad, right? Only Ramon and Michaels really feel like potential tournament winners, but at least the brackets have, you know, some genuine stars in them. But let's see how the rest of the field shakes out. Next up, Kama, the supreme pimp of voodoo censorship, beat pro wrestling's second most prolific trash man, Duke the Dumpster Drozzy. Then, in the first qualifier to actually feature more than one pushed wrestler, The Undertaker defeated Intercontinental Champion Jeff Jarrett. Meanwhile, Jarrett's roadie, well, simply named, well, the roadie, upended a beyond stale Doink the Clown to get into the tournament. The final qualifier pitied brothers-in-law Owen Hart and Davy Boy Smith against one another. Though the match sadly ended in a time limit draw, they didn't run it back and have a rematch between the two as WWF had done in prior instances of qualifiers ending in ties. Instead, the WWF ruled that Hart and Smith's respective tag team partners, Yokozuna and Lex Luger, would now face off for the final spot. Because, well, that makes sense, doesn't it? And Yoko won, because Luger is never allowed to score a meaningful win over Yokozuna, especially after they had to return the bus. So your King of the Ring field includes four men who've held singles gold before, along with a 500 pound beast still finding himself as a heel, as well as three occupational wrestlers, a race car driver, a fighter too badass for the UFC, and a personal assistant to a country singer. Now, 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 in WWF's defense, in the pay-per-view era of King of the Ring, this was probably no worse than the third best looking field they've ever presented. And still, at least those qualifying were objectively more impressive than the men they beat, which included, well, a, a radioactive mercenary, um, a, a, a country singer, a sanitation worker, and a 400 pound star of the 80s. And that's not forgetting a circus clown, a mythical beast, and a muted mountain man alongside Vince's first attempt at creating a new Hogan. Sounds like the worst ever season of the real world, but no, it was just the mid-card slate of the top American wrestling company in the mid-90s. Now, Common Sense had Michaels taking home the crown, because clearly he's the next WWF champion, right? Well, 
Like, who are you going to have him lose him to? Kama? The roadie? Really, this tournament has to be a vehicle for WWF's impending flag bearer, right? Well, most of the insiders shared that very same sentiment. After all, why put Michaels in the tournament if he's not going to win? Dave Meltzer also assumed that a Michaels win was the only sensible play, but acknowledged some disturbing noise in the Observer published two weeks before the pay-per-view. For whatever reason, the rumours floating around are that either Mabel or the roadie will win King of the Ring, with the Mabel rumour having the most talk. While either one would qualify as surprising, the idea of booking is to build to something that will make money and not simply fool the public. Neither of these guys is going to draw money, and Michaels is the one with potential to draw money. Look, sure, you could put someone like Mabel over, since there's a clear lack of strong heels on the roster like previously established. And Vince likes to push Hoss against Hoss, just like he did when Hogan was champ. But would Vince really deprive the crowd of something they'd be happy with, such as a Shawn Michaels victory, just to set up a not particularly overly talented super heavyweight as a main event guy? And I think we all know the answer to that question. Well, whomever goes over, at least the tournament action will be solid along the way. I mean, there's there's still Shawn Michaels and there's there's still Razor... Wait, Razor Ramon injured his ribs at a house show two weeks before King of the Ring. And he's not going to be able to compete in the tournament. Well, that's just great, isn't it? But who do you replace Razor with? You know, a star of that caliber, surely it's got to be someone pretty substantial considering, well, as I said, he's one of the biggest stars in the company. But nope, WWF instead went with Savio Vega. Now, to be clear, Savio Vega was a solid wrestler, but he really had nothing going for him at this point. For one thing, he just showed up in the company. Prior running Squang aside, Vega was repackaged into Savio character just six weeks before King of the Ring, and he didn't really have any signature moments to his name. Well, except for saving Razor from a two-on-one beatdown while the crowd collectively wondered, who's this dude with no sleeves? In other words, the audience still didn't have much of a clue who Savio Vega was supposed to be. We were told he was a childhood friend of Razor's, but the backstory pretty much ended there. He was just, here's a guy, Razor likes him, and you should like him too. Which is always a surefire way to get the audience behind someone. I guess a relatively unknown Vega's fine as a replacement wrestler. You know, as long as he doesn't, I don't know, go too deep into the tournament or something, or like get to the finals. Now to get Vega into the tournament, WWF had Savio win a qualifying match on that evening's pre-show, defeating a fading Erwin R. Shinster in about five minutes. This meant that Vega would face Yokozuna in the quarterfinals, while Rhodey would wrestle Holly, Michaels would face Kama, and Mabel took on The Undertaker. Now, if you're asking why the WWF waited until the night off to hold Savio's qualifier, now would be a good time to point out that in those days, they tape even months worth of TV at a time, and Razor's injury didn't occur until after they'd filmed all their TV for the weeks between pay-per-views. So there was no interim live programming to hold an emergency qualifier on until the pay-per-view itself. You know, it happens, unfortunately. Injuries happen. Speaking of happens and unfortunate, now is the time we turn our attention to the pay-per-view itself. Though attendance in general had been at troubling levels in recent times, the Philly faithful still turned up for the 1995 King of the Ring as over 16,000 fans jam-packed the spectrum. A large number of ECW supporters were among the crowd, including the ever-recognisable John Hat Guy Bailey at front row on ringside. With Bailey and Ilk on hand, it may have been a PG show, but there's still a chance that this wasn't going to be a PG crowd. The set was pretty glossy by 1995 standards, as the throne sat upon a stage next to the entranceway, which was a set of doors guarded by a very young Matt and Jeff Hardy, which they were decked out in purple and yellow pyjamas. I wonder how many times during this night Matt stood and, and thought to himself, I bet I can book something way more demented than this. With Vince McMahon and Doc Michael Hayes Hendricks on the call, the King of the Ring kicked off with, well, Vega being wheeled back to the ring and in action once more. Minutes after beating IRS, the still obscure Vega was trotted back to ringside to face the 600 pound tag team champion, Yokozuna, to begin the tournament properly. I guess it was quite important to give the new guy as much face time as possible to try and get him over. And what better way to get Vega over than to have him sit in a never-ending nerve hold. 
Now, that sounds harsh. So with all due respect to Yokozuna, who was a magnificent big man in the not too distant past, his continued weight gain whittled away any remaining resemblance of cardio and his diminished once awing agility. Yokozuna matches in this era had a specific pattern, some early exertion followed by a parade of rest holds, and this was no exception. The WWF dressed up the eight minute opener by having Jim Cornette Owen Hart and an injured Razor all wreak havoc at ringside, setting off a chain of events that concluded with Savio winning via countout. With two upset victories under Savio's belt, McMahon would try to play up Vega as the second coming of Rocky Balboa, the inspirational Philly underdog that seized a golden opportunity. Shame Nikolai Volkov was on the outs with WWF by this time. I mean, who wouldn't want to see Vega yell, Volkov, from the top of a snowy mountaintop? The tournament continued with the roadie beating Holly in a decent undercard match with a very messy finish. The future road dog was earmarked for a face turn and feud with boss Jeff Jarrett, so a win here made sense and the match was fine. But few would have guessed, however, that this battle of occupational mid-carders would end up a subjective candidate for match of the night. Yeah. Michaels vs Kama was next, and the crowd was excited. If there's one person that can kick a show in a high gear, especially in 1995, it's the electric HBK. The question is, can Sean maintain that electricity in up to three tournament matches? Oh wait, that's right. Sean and Kama went to a time limit draw, and the match was well beneath Sean's very high standards of 1995. It was right about here that Philadelphia turned on the King of the Ring. Remember the sustained boos in Pittsburgh when they realised that Daniel Bryan wasn't going to be in the Royal Rumble match? Well, same thing here. Philly was pissed. Fortunately, all is not lost. The Undertaker still in the tournament and he has to beat Mabel. Spoiler alert, he didn't beat Mabel. He's out. Bye Undertaker. Now, sure, it required a ref bump and the interference off Kama, but alas, The Undertaker took a pinfall loss in an atrociously slow match to Mabel. This development sadly deprived us all from ever finding out if The Undertaker would have worn the crown over the top of his brimmed hat. So, just to recap, that's two former WWF champions and a clear future WWF champion all get bounced in the quarterfinals, while those that advanced include an unknown Rocky analog, a sidekick, and a limited 500 pounder. The sidekick went out next as Savio defeated the roadie in the lone semi-final due to Mabel receiving a bye into the finals. Savio Vega versus Mabel was your King of the Ring final, but more on that in a bit. Taking a break from the tournament for a moment, the next match was Hart and Lawler's Kiss My Foot Clash. To prepare for the bout, Lawler apparently walked around barefoot around horse stalls, letting the fetid leavings infest his souls. Yes, he actually did this. They even showed us vignettes of Lawler doing it. Of course, Hart wasn't going to suffer such a major indignity on a pay-per-view unless, I don't know, Vince desperately needed to try and get the belt off him or something. So after interference from the terminally underrated Hakushi backfired, Hart made Lawler submit to the sharpshooter. Then Hart foiled another attack from the heels. Hart then stuck his bare foot into the King's mug. But that wasn't good enough for Brett. No, he then removed Lawler's own boot, folded him up and shoved Lawler's own dirty foot into his mouth. Lawler being the demonstrative heel that he is, sold it like he was going to throw up. And more on that, in a bit. After that mild bit of catharsis, it was time for the tournament final, the fourth match for Vega on the night and the second for Mabel. If you were playing Extreme Warfare Revenge and you booked Savio Vega four times, not only would you get a booking note saying that Vega is losing overness from overuse, but you'd also crash the game because it's nigh impossible for Vega to wind up less over than he was before this evening started without there being some sort of error code. The most over person in the match by a wide margin was Razor Ramon standing on the floor as Mabel and Vega proceeded to have a very bad match to the sound of indifference from a very bored crowd. Now rest holds were the order of the day as Mabel tried to bear hug his way through much of the eight and a half minutes bell to bell. Then it happened. The moment that succinctly sums up the WWF as a whole in 1995. As the match dragged on, a number of fatigued fans began chanting E-C-Dub, E-C-Dub, 
which Hat Guy Bailey in the front row gladly helped conduct. It was a sizable chant too. Commentator McMahon didn't understand what he was hearing. He just recognised that noise was being made and interpreted that noise as a sudden surge of support for underdog Vega. He exclaimed, listen to this, with urgent cheeriness before realising it was a chant of spite and quickly changed the subject. The dissenters had breached the perimeter and they were loud. Wholesale rejection of the script may have been more common by the time Cena and Reigns eras had rolled around, but in 1995 this was something out of the Twilight Zone. Mabel won the tournament in a very anticlimactic fashion before beating down Ramon and the 1-2-3 kid post-match with the aid of his men on the mission teammate Mo. So ended one of the most uninspired, dreadful tournaments anybody could remember. Well, there was one more piece of business to attend to, the coronation. Mabel received a crown, a cape and a sword which Vince was very likely going to need back when he violently cut payroll the next month, while Mo read a proclamation from a scroll. Philly's response to this landmark moment was to shower the two men with a hail of trash. Then we took it backstage and we saw Jerry the King Lawler throw up, possibly from the horse poo stuck in his teeth or possibly from watching the previous match. There's really no way to know for sure. Now, it's really hard to believe that this was the angle that led to Kane first appearing on WWF television. The alleged main event rolled around in which Diesel and Bigelow faced Sid and Tatanka. Diesel was working with an injured elbow and really couldn't do much, which was just as well because the opposition didn't do much either. They really resorted to little more than basic strikes over the entire 17 and a half minutes. The finish saw Diesel powerbomb and pin Tatanka, all while goading Sid to get into the ring and fight him. But this almighty, this big, scary Sid responded by walking out like a coward, leaving Tatanka to eat the pin. Now, I will take this point to reiterate that Diesel and Sid were set to face off for the world title at the very next month on pay-per-view, and this big intimidating threat to the champion has just shown turning his tail and running away. Doesn't really set up the match, does it? A feud this big, though, you can almost picture the My Way hype video in your head. Almost. If not for the flop that was 1985's wrestling classic, the 1995 King of the Ring would have been the least bought WWF pay-per-view to date, with just 150,000 buys. The only Big Five pay-per-view that would ever do a lower number pre-network days was that year's Survivor Series, which honestly is a shame because that's actually quite a good show. Dave Meltzer wasn't too kind to King of the Ring, rating only three matches higher than two stars, with none crossing the three star mark. Meltzer wrote, it was so bad, one can only speculate on how those booking the show in the first place thought they'd be able to pull it off. As of August 2022, fans on the Cage Match Wrestling Database rate this show a 1.28 out of a possible 10, with four out of every nine voters giving the show an absolute zero. As of this recording, out of every WWE pay-per-view ever, it has the lowest score of any event that didn't take place in Saudi Arabia. So, what did we learn from the 1995 King of the Ring? Well, we learned that there are some shows that Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels just cannot save. We learned that undesirable booking in a large vocal market can kill a crowd quicker than the opening bars of Rob Conway's theme music. We learned that the most popular WWF star in the Philadelphia market in 1995 was some fella named ECW. Maybe he should have been brought in with a schoolteacher gimmick instead of that Douglas guy. We learned that taking a sizable gamble in booking a new main event star can backfire spectacularly. Not only was Mabel a poor choice of King, but his ensuing run as a top heel reflected that poor choice. His match with Diesel at SummerSlam was bad for a number of reasons, and he'd be gone from the company by the end of the following January, barely six months after he was crowned King. And we learned that booking what you want instead of what the fans want will piss off a lot of people. Of course, this lesson has sometimes been forgotten or ignored in the years since. Sometimes. The 1995 King of the Ring set a historical precedent for badness in pro wrestling events. It might not be the worst pay-per-view of all time, but it's one of the first to come to mind when one asks, what's the worst pay-per-view you can think of? And a historical standing like that 
makes 1995 King of the Ring incredibly hard to dethrone.